irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to What Women Want with Judy Goss and Kristen West, only on L.A. Talk Radio. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to What Women Want Talk Radio. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our show, Anxious Much. I'm broadcasting from New York, and my co-host, Kristen West, is sitting in our beautiful studio at L.A. Talk Radio. Hi, Judy. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Oh my gosh, it, we are so grateful for our listeners because we've reached over 1 million downloads since we first hit the airwaves between latalkradio.com's archives, iTunes, Google Play, we're on YouTube, and of course all over social media. So you can find us literally everywhere. So listen to those replays and subscribe to us on YouTube if you like us, which I'm sure you will. We're taking sponsors for our show for the next few months. Email us for a complete deck through our website whatwomenwantradio.com. And speaking of sponsors, Design and Print Resource is our sponsor for this segment of What Women Want. She is always oh, so supportive of women and everyone buys printing in some form at some point. So the company you can trust for great service is Design and Print Resource. Gloria Strayer, who has a great story, by the way, she's founder and owner of Design and Print Resource in Anaheim, California, and has been in the print industry for over 40 years. Her services also include warehousing and distribution. So give them a call at 714-687-9200 or go to dnpresource.com. Now, last week, we touched on the business of entrepreneurship and what feelings of anxiety and loneliness that can cause. And this week, we're going to dive deeper into the world of anxiety and depression with psychologist Dr. Colleen Mullen and financial expert Deborah Daniel, who have both seen cases of severe anxiety and what causes it and how we can treat it and how they react to it, I'm sure, also. Now, I'm sure everyone has heard by now the tragedy of Kate Spade, and her suicide. And we actually put this show together before that happened. So it's really a timely topic all the way around. I truly feel for her family. And Kristen, you know, we've spoken several times on the show about the masks that people wear to put on brave faces, but especially celebrities with their constant outward appearances, being on TV, their faces on huge screens. And, you know, their expressions don't quite sometimes match what's inside, you know? It's very true. And there's a a um a quote circulating around that I think is very salient about the situation is that you can have a very successful business, you can have notoriety, you can have fame, but you never truly know what the person is going through on the inside. And it, it made me very sad to hear of Kate Spade's death. It is really sad. And it's, you know, even sadder that no one from what I'm reading anyway, I, I didn't know her personally, but I feel like no one really knew what was happening except for possibly her sister. And I'm not sure even her inner circle realized what was going on. So the people that are going through this really have a way of hiding it. And, and it's difficult, I think, to see, you know, what they're going through and how to, you know, figure out how to help them and draw it out. So Dr. Colleen Mullen is going to give us some great insight on how to go about doing that and, you know, how to detect it and what we can do and that type of thing. So I'm excited to have her on. And Deborah sure as heck sounds like she's come upon, you know, she's in the finance industry. So I'm sure she sees anxiety in a lot of different ways there too. And so we're going to pick this topic apart with our guests coming on in just a few minutes. And I am hosting uh, AWE's TV show, Behind the Gate. I am very excited to announce that. And my background actually comes from high fashion modeling with Ford New York. And after that, I was a magazine editor, which led me to TV hosting and reporting for Better TV, City Buzz, and all the TV networks around the country, both regional and national. I'm a regular on NBC and Fox, and I founded the company What Women Want Networking seven years ago. And we're hosting our second national women's conference, October 19th through the 21st, at the Hyatt Regency in Atlanta, Georgia. You should join us. I'm also a St. Martin's Press author and the mom of teenage twin girls. So if you want to meet me in person, 
and my co-host, Kristen West, and or perhaps you want to rub shoulders with Amy Newmark, who just confirmed she's the opening keynote for the conference. She's the CEO of Chicken Soup for the Soul, editor-in-chief, publisher, author, brilliant woman. And last year was our first conference, and women from 13 states in Canada attended, along with speakers from all over the country, including David Baer, who's the newest motivational mindset sensation. We're honored that he's coming back to keynote. And also Cecilia Lank. She's the CEO of Value Setters. And she's our closing keynote, which I find interesting that she and Amy Newmark, her, both their pu- companies went public last year. So they're, you know, huge in their industries. Kelly McNellis is going to have a stop from her Truth Teller tour, and Catherine Marshall from Simple Fat Burn will be there speaking, and a whole mix of celebrities, VIPs, and surprise guests, and the kind of crowd this conference attracts, you will want to be a part of it all, so go to What Women Conf, what women want conf, excuse me, dot com and grab your early bird ticket, I think for nine days left. They're going to, going to go back up in price, only $197 for three days, it's pretty good. Kristen, so that's what's going on in Atlanta. What's going on in Hollywood with you? Every week you have something new, some new fabulous accomplishment that you're doing with either your award-winning TV show, film, acting, screenwriting. I can't keep track of it all. I'm so excited because next week I'm going to be hosting and emceeing the Concrete Dreams Film Festival, which is an avant-garde film festival. And that film festival was founded by the uh, lovely Rena Riffle, of Mohal. Which is a what film festival? What did Av- you say? Avant-garde film festival. So it's an oh wow. So, so these are experimental films. They're they're non-traditional films in the sense that they don't necessarily have a traditional beginning, middle, end narrative structure. They're they're kind of like if you know Dali made a film. David Lynch is also you know in some respects considered experimental in his filmmaking and his filmmaking style. So these are our filmmakers who really are doing art for art's sake, um, much like Maya Darren did as well. That and sounds like a fun event to MC. I, I think it's going to be a blast. And I'm so excited to be a part of that and hosting the Q and A's and hosting the red carpet and working with Rena on that. And if you haven't checked out Rena, um, you should check her out on IMDb. She was in Mulholland Drive. She's worked with David Lynch. She has an amazing and impressive film career, and she's really supporting um, these uh, artists who really just want to test what cinema can do. So I'm really proud to be and excited, frankly, to be a part of that. Mm, congratulations. Now, when is this happening and where? Uh, June, uh, the weekend of June 10th. It will be happening in Hollywood. So uh, so so glamorous. Yeah. So you'll be seeing, you know, tweets and Instagram posts and Facebook posts of of all of that. So just uh, keep tabs on my social media uh, and and you'll see all of that. And you can also just uh, Google Concrete Dreams Film Festival to to learn more about it. Concrete Dreams and Domain of Horror, all these incredible titles (laughs) that you're doing. How's that show going? It's going good. We're on hiatus now, but we have some great guests uh, booked for our second season. So I can't can't tell you who they are yet, but I'm really excited about that as well because we've got some amazing guests coming up, just like we have week after week here. I love it. Well, it sounds so fascinating. I, I just love following your career and you're just... Zooming up and up into the, you know, atmosphere with all of your awards and shows and red carpets. And it's just wonderful to see you doing so well. Oh, thank you so much, Judy. And you're an inspiration to me each and every week. Oh, and you are to me. And let's extend that love to Dr. Colleen Mullen because she's a relationship uh, coach. (laughs) So I don't think we need one yet, Kristen, but you never know. So let's bring her on. (laughs) She's a relationship activist and the founder of both Coaching Through Chaos Private Practice in San Diego and the podcast of the same name. She's been helping her clients have more fulfilling relationships for almost two decades. Her work, her work has been featured on Fortune, Psych Central, Martha Stewart Weddings, Huffington Post, and on over 70 websites, Jeez, radio shows or podcasts over the last three years. She has a lot to say on taking care of your emotional self. Welcome back to the show, Colleen. Thanks, both Judy and Kristen, for having me on. It's always a good time to be here. Oh, good. It's it's our pleasure. And so let's jump right into it. You Basically, you specialize in relationships, right? I see all of, all of your videos being posted, and you always have great things to say. You know, a, a lot of things that we should be paying attention, attention to, that's for sure. 
Right. And I do. I specialize in relationships, but that also means, you know, everybody's individual relationship with themselves as well. Uh, so I do a lot of individual therapy as well. And so I've definitely worked with people over the years with anxiety disorders and uh, some very extreme ones as well. So, uh, you know, I love talking about how to help people out of these situations. Well, good, because we, lo- we are going to love to hear how to kind of dissect this whole anxiety issue. I feel like the word is overused, um, but we're going to get into that in just a minute. Uh, You know, you specialize in relationships, and it really sounds like Kate Spade was tortured over hers. From what I'm reading, like I said, I don't know her in person, but Mm -hmm. what is your take on the situation? You know, why would someone want to kill themselves over a relationship? I mean, it just seems so, I don't know, I can't comprehend it. Well, and without knowing anything else, you know, we, we, we can go with the fact that she was apparently separated from her husband and there was some anguish over that. Uh, but there is, uh, you know, uh, a history, at least from what we're hearing from the news reports, of a long-term battle of anxiety, depression, possibly bipolar disorder, which mm. that, you know, is, is something that, and then I've read even reports that she was afraid of going for treatment for that because she was like happy-go-lucky, you know, keep a brand, you know, it was all bright and cheery, and she was afraid that it would hurt her brand, which is just so terribly sad to see. But, you know, relationships definitely can cause people to feel depression. They can certainly cause anxiety and gloom and doom. And, um, and I did hear, um, I saw an interview with her where she talked about her anxiety specifically and just said she's a warrior. And she wishes that she worried less. She said that about a year ago in an interview. And uh, then another statement I saw that, um, without quoting her, something about, like, waiting for the next shoe to drop. Like, she's a catastrophizer. And so all of that speaks to, you know, uh, a predisposition to, you know, for anxiety. Um, Now, and and, and she's, mm -hmm. but she sounds like she was aware that she worried so much So Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, maybe she wasn't getting enough help for it or the right kind of help or what's going on there? And that's that's what I'm seeing in the reports is that there might not have been any. I don't see any reports that like there's actually like knowledge that she went for help for this. Mm -hmm. So if she's a person, I mean, I guess I'm I'm, I'm kind of speaking for a person down. Yeah, and I'm kind of speaking for everyone, like not necessarily, I don't want you to kind of predict what happened to Kate Spade, mm-hmm. um, but I, I guess I'm talking to to people out there that are listening that, you know, if someone's going through this constant worry and, you, you know, and they're not mm-hmm. getting help or, or if they are getting help and they're still worrying so much that they can't control it, I mean, mm-hmm. it must be, what's the first step there? Do you, I guess you have to get really specific on, you know, what mm-hmm. is going on. As far as the mm-hmm. diagnosis first, or what? What ha- tell us? Yeah, uh, I mean, know, I know it's so complicated. There's not just one answer, right? But but anxiety is really just our phys- physiological response to stress. Like, and we all have it. We all get anxious over some things. Where it becomes a disorder, and is when it affects how we function in the world. And certainly, if there's you know, when people that maybe relate to what what we're reading about Kate say. Um, you know, kind of relate to the constant worrying, waiting for the shoe to drop, catastrophizing, you know, there's a snowball effect that goes on in our brain, Um, you know, so so reaching out to get some help where, you know, talk therapy certainly is is a great start, but in some of the tips I'm going to talk about, one of them is even just reaching out to a friend and putting words to the, to the, I want to say the craziness in the brain, because that's what anxiety feels like. Anxiety, anxious thoughts feel like, like a person's going crazy when they know that they're catastrophizing, they know the reality of the situation is not what they're making it out to be in their head, but they can't stop worrying about it. They feel crazy. And, um, you know, and then there are several, I mean, anxiety has several, you know, we could clinically diagnose a person several ways with anxiety. There's social anxiety. There's general anxiety. There's panic attacks. There's um, obsessive compulsive disorder. uh, And then there's even PTSD. Uh, which, you know, we could say is on uh, the anxiety spectrum. But I don't want to talk too much about PTSD in relation to this topic because this is more about 
um, you know, we're talking more about general anxiety tips. Yeah, um, and I, I saw a post, Kristen, that you made, you know, you made a poll, you know, how often do you experience anxiety? And I, I actually got kind of anxious reading your poll because <laughs> the, the choices were, you know, a few times a month, a few times a week, a few times a day. And then I started thinking, Hmm. I wonder if I'm more anxious than I think I am. This, you know, this many times <laughs> oh, a day, no. and this, I, I, my brain started flying around. What are some of the answers you got there? You know, it's interesting. I actually did a separate version of this on on uh, Instagram too, and it was like I get it. Some people were like, I get anxious all the time, and I think you and um, shout out to Lucy Brummett who responded to my poll. Um, Anxiety, I think, is circumstantial because some things you trigger you more than others. So your anxiety yeah. pattern yeah. may be different in any given month. Do you find that to be true, Dr. Colleen? Yes, I did actually want to speak to the fact that some people are, you know, more physiologically prone to anxiety where they just kind of always ride a bit jumpy so that when life stress happens, they, they might be the people that are prone to panic attacks and stuff. And then there are other people that are affected by the external circumstances in their world, whether it's their job stress, their relationship stress, the finances. So there are some people that can, you know, get through life, you know, pretty steady, but like a big upheaval happens. And then all of a sudden they're dealing with, you know, the, the worry and the worry thoughts um, that go along with it. Uh, so, yeah, there's definitely people that are predisposed uh, biologically to, to anxiety than others that are affected by the environment. Now, let's say that you have a con- you you've already been diagnosed with a condition like depression. Mm-hmm. Are you more prone also to have um, clinical level anxiety that needs to be treated, or are there are there any other conditions that kind of maybe can accompany anxiety more often than not that maybe people need to look into? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. So yes, anxiety and depression kind of, um, you know, can tag team each other. Usually somebody has some anxiety over the level of depression that they have. And of course, if they're getting suicidal, their anxiety may rise because they're afraid that they might act on it at times. And then we also have things like addiction. Lots of alcoholism and drug addiction is to mask um, anxiety and depression. Uh, and then, uh, and then we also have, it's not really a formal diagnosis, but, uh, in this case, you know, it's relevant and there's a lot of people out there that will relate. It's called imposter syndrome and people worry that they're just not good enough. No matter what they do, they, you know, don't feel good enough. They don't feel worthy. And although, you know, we see this usually, you know, we think of that for public figures, um, you know, I definitely, I treat lots of people um, with some form of this. Like I said, it's not a real diagnosis, but it is kind of this phenomenon that we that we see in, in our culture these days. And I've seen it range from elementary school teachers to lawyers to therapists, doctors, uh, you know, and it's about people kind of feeling like the thought behind that is a very anxious thought. The thought behind their insecurity is if people only knew the real me, you know, they, they, Either they wouldn't trust me, they wouldn't like me, they wouldn't believe me, they wouldn't, you know, respect me. Uh, and, you know, it all stems from this idea of not being good enough or not doing enough. Um, and in general, that they're not enough for the world. And so, um, so that definitely goes hand in hand with, with anxiety. And then, like I said, specifically, if you have people that are, you know, in the upper levels of their jobs, you can, you, you'll find it quite a bit, a lot of college professors. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of struggle with it. Right. So it's, it's, it's kind of a cultural phenomenon that that we've got going on. I love right that you now. brought up. I love that you brought up imposter syndrome because I think it's relevant to the conversation that we've been having about Kate Spade. And I think mm-hmm. one of the biggest hurdles people who really need a professional like you have to get over mm-hmm. is, is this this fear of of what's going to happen to me once I go into therapy. So when someone goes into treatment for Mm -hmm. severe anxiety, what Mm -hmm. should they expect? Because I think some people have such a fear of, of of taking that first step that they never even attempt to take it. Yes. So, you know, coming in for therapy, you know, talk therapy is about giving a person a place to, safely like unpack their emotional baggage and you know the therapist is 
you know, we hope non-judgmental, uh, and uh, also can help them help normalize some of that process because a lot of times, like I'm thinking of some uh, executives that I've worked for and I have a, a story that I, I usually tell about somebody's uh, one particular person's anxiety um, but uh, you know, they have a hard time uh, well, where I'm going to go is that we normalize their process because they think they are the only ones that think this way and one of you know, one of my clients that comes to my two clients that show just how severe the anxiety can be for people. And I had one client, if I remember correctly, because this is many years ago, a woman in her early 30s, and when I say early, I mean like maybe 31, 32, um, and she came in and she presented the way many people do after they have a panic attack, they go to the ER thinking that they're having a heart attack. So a 31-year-old woman walks into the ER relatively healthy thinking she has a heart attack, most of the treating uh, physicians and nurses even then know, okay, well, we're probably dealing with anxiety because the likelihood of her having a heart attack is very low. Mm -hmm. um, so then they might get referred for therapy. But this particular woman, though, didn't, didn't, didn't believe it because she was so anxious that over a very limited amount of time, like maybe a few months, she convinced over 30 medical providers to perform or over, she, sorry, she convinced her medical providers to, to uh, run over 30 EKGs. What? Because she just insisted that something was wrong with her heart. And they're like, no, you're just having panic attacks. And so finally she presented for therapy and you know, it doesn't take long. Like, I love working with people who have panic attacks because it doesn't take very long to start really helping them. Mm -hmm. Panic attacks well, are something that, that can is, really uh, be corrected pretty pretty quickly when you've got a good rapport with the client and they're engaged and really wanting to fix the problem. Okay, besides wanting an EKG 30 times, what <laughs> are the signs <laughs> that you need to go speak to someone? I feel like... For some reason, I'm 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 thinking that some of us maybe need to embrace our anxiety a little bit more because you're saying everybody has some and 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 thank God for that because now I feel a little more normal. <laughs> but um, right, I feel like there are some definite signs where someone can take a look at themselves and think, "Ooh, it's time to go see someone." Absolutely, absolutely. So when we talk about panic attacks, we're talking about those extreme times where. They feel they literally feel their heart is is clenching, their stomach they may be nauseous, uh, they may start sweating. They have a, an extreme physiological response um, to uh, a stimuli that is not that you know worry inducing. So that's an extreme case is a panic attack. But when we're talking about this general anxiety we talk about, you know, how we say a person needs help is when it starts affecting your daily life. So if you are a person who has a high stress job. And yet you are unable to focus at that job because you're so worried about making a mistake, then you probably should come in and talk to somebody about that because you're actually sabotaging yourself by getting stuck in the ruminating thoughts. Um, if you're a person that craves social interaction, but every time you get invited out to an event, you know, you say yes. But then that day comes and you get so worked up and you worry about what you're going to look like and who's going to have a better dress on or is somebody going to talk to you or, you know, or that you're not going to make a good impression, uh, you know, and so you don't go, that's a person who should come in and talk about that because those kind of, that kind of anxiety can, can be treated. When it stops well. you from doing something that you that should you be following through with, right, or that you really kind of yeah. want to do, but you're making excuses not to do it. Right. Uh, and then anxiety can also take shape as anger. Um, you know, so if you've got someone who rides, you know, rides high, you know, uh, this jumpy kind of person and they're running into problems in their relationship on, on a, on a pretty regular basis where their partner is saying like, I don't understand why you're responding to me like that. I was just asking you a question, you know, because their response is so over the top, um, you know, and irritable, that person is probably dealing with some anxiety and, and certainly that situation can be helped through some talk therapy as well. And, um, and then I know people get a little uh, nervous about the idea of like, well, if I go in for therapy, do I have to go on medication? And, you know, a lot of times 
uh, clinical diagnosis, um, you know, do often work best. There is research out there saying that for certain types of anxiety disorders, um, medication can allow a person to do better in psychotherapy, in talk therapy. Uh, and that would really be because the, the medication, which is usually a daily antidepressant because they usually also work on anxiety, allows some... Colleen? Hello? ...at our boiling point. When a person is just... When a person is constantly anxious, they... Um, they taking a, a daily antidepressant can allow them some emotional room to um, kind of have some of life circumstances happen to them. It's a very complicated topic. Uh, it's complicated mm-hmm. as each person is, and I'm so glad. Well, well it is. Mm-hmm. And, and I just want to put on about talking about meds. A lot of times, though, anxiety uh, and things like panic attacks uh, and some level of general anxiety can be helped through talk therapy. So I want a person to know that when they come in for therapy, because I know it's a scary process, when they come in for therapy, you always have, you know, you have the right to say, I, I don't want to do meds or anything else. Talk to therapy, yeah, or I mean, you talk medication. to them for, I'm sure, a certain amount of time before you even consider medication, um, unless they're having severe attacks, I'm assuming. Absolutely. And, and i you know, when I can't prescribe medication, I would say I'm an academic doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. So I would have to refer out to a medical doctor for that. And that is only with the client's consent. And what I like to tell a person, though, is when you're going to start talk therapy, go at least six times uh, before you give up on it. Because a lot of times people go in with an expectation that says, well, this is what you specialize in. You're supposed to be able to help me. Let's do this today. And that's not <laughs> Fix how me. The Damn it works. now. <laughs> you know, we're not going to talk you out of a panic attack, but what we can do is teach you skills to help yourself when those things come on or teach you how to get over some of your social anxiety, some thought exercises, um, and then some behavioral uh, changes. I think the advice you're giving about all of this is something everybody needs to see and hear and take heart. And I'm, I'm sure our listeners need to hear more from you, Dr. Colleen. So how do they find you online? Sure. So um, my website is coaching through chaos.com. And they can find me on social media. Um, I'm at Dr. Colleen Mullen. If they just um, put that uh, in, they'll find my Twitter, my Instagram, my Facebook. I also have a business page on Facebook for Coaching Through Chaos. So, however, and some great YouTube me, videos also. Thank you. And, and thanks for mentioning that because I'm actually um, going to be moving my live uh, videos that I do on Facebook every Tuesday. I'm actually going to be starting to do them live on YouTube. So, yeah, I'd love for them to look up Coaching Through Chaos and Colleen Mullen on YouTube, and they'll find my channel there. And just subscribe, because over the next couple of months, there's going to be a lot more content going on there. Well, that is awesome. And what a great resource for everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Dr. Colleen. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it, and I hope it was helpful for your listeners. Well, it was definitely helpful for me, and I'm sure it was helpful for Judy, too, right? Uh, Yeah, I'm like sitting here chewing on my pen. It's about to crack. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, well, you know, I have a lot of tips for you, too, but we'll do that another time. <laughs> exactly. We're going to, you know, we, we'll we all... go offline in a minute, Dr. Colleen. That's Thank right. you so much for coming on the show. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, one of the most Great. chaotic things you can go through besides chewing on your pen and getting ink in your mouth um, is a layoff. It's a divorce. It's a drop in your finances. And I think Deborah Daniels knows all about all of this stuff because she's coached so many people through the finances, all of this. And, you know, if you've ever fought with your significant other about money, well, that's an anxiety button now, isn't it? So she's going to show us how to protect ourselves for when that happens, because inevitably money is a part of life and can cause us anxiety. Deborah Daniel is the founder and CEO of Charter Accounting and she became an entrepreneur in 1993, soon after completing her MBA. Um, I am going to just say for a second, Judy, 
you know, money, it's, it's a crazy thing, isn't it? I mean, so many people get invested in their, their net worth and not their happiness, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I actually found myself in that situation personally, <laughs> because, you know, um, my family went bankrupt during the recession, and it overtook me. And I mean, there was nothing, I, I kept thinking to myself, okay, I don't have health issues, I don't have, you know, anything else going on um, at the moment, but the finances really were you know, uh, uh, the mainstay of, of what I was living and breathing every day. And if you have something like that happen to you or, or other situations too, which a lot of people did during the recession, it does tend to completely just engulf you with emotions and, you know, everyday situations that you're kind of wondering at some point, you know, can I get through the next day, the next hour? I know. And Deborah Daniel has held people's hands through all of these types of situations for over 25 years, which is incredible. She's helped entrepreneurs and individuals in all areas of money and finance. And having thrived in the traditionally male-dominated field of finance, Deborah extends her money knowledge into the areas of business success strategies and building overall financial confidence. And boy, do women need that. By helping clients figure out what the numbers really matter, in their business and their life. She helps them to level up their business and their personal lives. Welcome to the show, Deborah. Well, thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Judy. I'm so glad to be here. It's funny that you said that, Judy, um, about your family, because I've kind of coined a little bit of a phrase that I, it's just my own little phrase, but post-recession stress syndrome, because I have just seen how differently people are acting since the 2008, 2009 timeframe. But having done it for 25 years, I mean, I've seen everything. There have been really good times. I mean, come on, we had the tech boom back in the late 90s. I mean, we've had really good times and really bad times. But the the common denominator is that money impacts all of it. And And you're right. I mean, the psychological impact you know, to, for me to get past that took years and years. Oh, people's attitude. I mean, I was reading earlier, I, I'm just kind of a junkie about this whole money and, you know, how it affects us and it's a tool and just how people react to it and, you know, are re- reactive to or towards it. Um, I do sometimes feel like, it, you know, my background is a CPA, but I do a lot more than just look back at, at the numbers and fill out a tax return is what people, you know, traditionally think of as a CPA, to me, it's the whole scope. It's more, more like, I'm more like an alternative medicine money doctor. Um, mm-hmm. like- and that's why you're on the show, honestly, <laughs> because you do combine that whole holistic view, you know, with the finances. I mean, we could get any CPA, you know, on here talking about, oh, the five great tips on how to save your money, but you do ha- come from a different perspective and it's refreshing. Well, I mean, and the thing is people... It- we, I mean, I often say, you know, especially because I talk a lot with business owners, but everything that – one thing that I'm definitely sure of, you can't have a rocking business if you have your personal fin- finances in a mess. I mean, it's just they, – they, it's mutually – exclusive to be able to do both. So when I'm speaking to business owners, I'm often talking about their business, but if their finances on the personal side, are, it, it, we all have the same problems, whether we work for a corporation or whether we're doing our own thing. Um, but the biggest thing is, is really having that right, you know, balance of, you know, what is, what's really important. I mean, obviously, like you were saying, we're not pursuing just that net worth. We're pr- pursuing some kind of a, a balance in our life. But if we don't have this money piece together, all the other things, I mean, no matter what we say, I often say business is money. Life isn't about business. Life isn't about money, but business is. But it really, all of our life is impacted by money. So we can't just stick our head in the sand and act like it's not something big because it does impact people. I did notice another thing that was really interesting about that 2008, 2009 timeframe is you could tell how impacting that was on people's the the whole money situation was on their relationships because I mean I have I do a lot of returns I, my firm my team and I do about a thousand people's um, returns a year and a normal year we might see three or four people divorce cases that during the two thousand eight nine even into ten we were seeing twenty you know twenty or twenty five I mean that's a huge increase of people getting divorced and I know it's related we're talking to, about relationship uh, angst. 
I mean, it's, it's related to, I mean, this is a funny thing. I, I would laugh with my team about it a little bit. I'm like, well, you know, you could kind of put up with the socks on the floor if the money's coming in. But when the money stops coming in and the socks are on the floor, maybe it's time to kind of say, wait, this is not working out for me. I mean, just empirically, just observation, you know, a bit, I think that's a big enough sample to think, you know, I think the money thing really does have an impact. We'll put up with a lot of the other, you know, oh, he comes home late or oh, he doesn't listen to me or, or, you know, he doesn't help around the house. But when the money stops, those things become unsurmountable. You know, you can put up with them when you've got the grease of the money flowing, Mm -hmm. which I often like to point out, you know, when we refer to, you know, we call it currency exchange with the different um, countries, the different currencies, but money really is a flow. You know, it is. You know, it, it's refer- that's why that's where the whole currency thing came from was the flow of of money. You know, right. throughout the world and throughout transactions and stuff. And I think that's what stresses people out. I think the most is when they maybe not how much they have, mm-hmm. but how much they need to continue to to maintain what they're doing. And when that stops or when they see a way that that isn't going to continue, that really causes a lot of stress. And I think throws us in almost into that, you know, you lose your security and it becomes a fight or flight kind of um, response. You know, there's this saying, and it's an old saying, that when poverty comes through the door, love goes out the window. So I think that you're speaking, you're speaking, and actually there's a painting of that, by the way, it's a, it's a classical painting, but I, I forget who painted that. Only you'd know this, Kristen. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it, nerd queen over here in Los Angeles. But, you know, you make a point about relationships. And when, when you, when you clients come in the door, what, what is the thing that makes them most anxious? Is it the IRS? <laughs> what is, what makes, what's, what's the big financial anxiety p- most often that you see when, the, when people are coming to you for advice? Logging well, into the bank you, account. I mean, well, the IRS thing is, I mean, everybody freaks out. As soon as they get a letter, they call in there. I mean, a lot of them are computer, computer generated and 99% of them can be handled with just a quick call or a letter. So, but of course that freaks everybody out. But I think, you know what I'm seeing, because we're seeing more and more people retire every single day. I mean, the, you know, the baby boomers are, you know, retiring in droves. I'm seeing um, a lot more clients worried about, do they have enough money to last? as long as they're going to live because we've got this double-edged sword thing kind of going on that all of a sudden our life expectancies, I mean, I have a lot of clients in their late seventies and eighties and a couple of nineties. I mean, you would just not have, I mean, 20 years ago, there weren't a lot of 90 year olds running around. And I think people are really nervous about not having enough money to last. I'm glad that you brought up that retirement issue because, and to going back, throw back to 2008, is that a lot of people in get, marching towards retirement right now in their in their late fifties, sixties, even late sixties, are parents of the millennial generation, and and there's a lot of millennials, people born from nineteen eighty to two thousand, who entered the job market right at two thousand eight, and you know have been s- struggling for a long time to make what are what our parents did in terms of of wages and wage stability and so it, it's an intergenerational financial issue that goes on there so i really appreciate that you brought that up what do you think is the most important step in reducing financial anxiety you brought up that you can't have a rock in business if you're not rocking your own personal finances what what is the most important step you think to reducing that financial anxiety I just, I mean, I know there's a place for debt, but I think managing your debt and understanding, I mean, if we waited till everybody had cash to pay for a house, none of us would own houses. So I'm not saying that debt is bad, but you really need to understand the difference between good debt and bad debt. If it's for your home, it's if it's for something that's going to be income producing, if it's, it's, if it's for, um, you know, anything that has a return on it, but to go out and spend beyond your means on the, you know, a purse that's really expensive or, you know, you just, you just have to manage that. I mean, I'm not saying you can't have things that you want, but you have to know that it's not all about having it. You can have everything. I just don't think you can have it all at the same time. And so if you can keep that debt under control that's a huge thing that I see people have a problem with. Um, and I also, and it, people just want to live 
live beyond their means. I mean, we, we have a, I mean, it's really sad. We kind of have to laugh about it or else we'll be really, really sad when you do people's returns and they're making really good income, but there's no interest. There's no dividends. There's no, you know, rental properties or partnership returns or anything. So, you know, there's no investing going on. So whatever they're making, if that's $5 or if that's $500,000, they're spending every cent of it. You can't do that. No matter what your level of income is, you've got to have a cushion. And that includes, you know, that means in, I don't like the word budget. I just feel like that's very limiting. I tell my people, my clients, let's make a money plan. I mean, let's, let's, let's map it out, but we don't, let's not say budget. That just has a very negative connotation to it. But I do think having some kind of a structure just makes you feel better. I mean, it, it, structure is freedom in, in every part of our life. I love that idea. And I totally agree with that is that there is something tremendously empowering and freedom giving about having certain structures in your life. And I think you made a great point about consumer debt, because I think so many people just think that debt is a natural part of life and it's inevitable, but but really it's how you use it. It can be a great tool to grow your business or grow your wealth when you apply it correctly. When, when you have people coming in, what's the biggest mistake people make when they're dealing with money if they have anxiety? What, what's, what's the mindset of anxiety? How does it impact your money? Well, I think the, the, really the biggest problem is that they're scared about it and then they just don't they just don't want to look at it. I mean, I have a, I have a, a one example of a client that came in that's like, our daughter's going to college next year. We're barely making our pills now. We've saved some money, but we don't feel like we have enough. And they were just so stressed out. I mean, and the thing is, when we sat down and we systematically looked at what they had, what they had in their retirement accounts, what they had saved for their daughter – they actually were so set, it wasn't even funny. We removed, we just took a few things around and moved them around a little bit and made them a little more efficient. And, we, and I showed them how they were not only set to pay for their daughter wherever she wanted to go to school, but then also they were way ahead of where they needed to be. They were only 50, and they, had, um, they were on track to have a ton when they, when they retired. And the thing is, it's because you're worrying and not looking at really the reality. It, it just, it's almost like comparing a little bit like, well, the neighbors have this or the neighbors have that. It doesn't matter what, what everybody else's situation is. You've got to look at what your expenses are and what your income is and what your goals are. And sometimes you're in much better shape than you think you are. And most people I think are, they just assume that it's worse than it, than it is. They just have to get it organized and, and kind of tease it all out and put it into perspective, which it sounds like you do. What was your impetus in going into this industry into this industry you know really i've always been it's funny um uh just because you're so up. passionate about it and you've been <laughs> doing it for so long and and i just i'm really curious to your story well, you know, behind I think it part of it is i i do think part of it is just like we live through the recession i know my grandparents lived through the depression and i i remember growing up just things about money, you know, just, you know, there were just lots of things that people said, you have to work hard and, you know, money is hard. And, you know, just those little messages were given as we're, as we're growing up, those kind of stay with you. And you want to like either live with them or disprove them. And just the whole money thing has always been very intriguing to me. I mean, I remember as a little kid when my, actually my dad won the lottery when we were little, a small little lottery, like $10,000 or something like that. And he gave my sister and I $500. And when we put it in the bank, this was back in the 70s, and the interest rate in the bank account then was like five and three quarters. I mean, we haven't seen that in a long time now. We don't even get 1%. But I thought that was the coolest thing. And I like to see my little passbook. Um, I'd like to go and they would, you know, you'd give it to the teller. This is so dating me. But you'd give it to the teller and they would like credit your interest in your little passbook. And I just all, I loved Monopoly as a kid. I don't know. Maybe I've just been, just the whole money thing. Um, has always um, been of interest to me. Kristen, isn't she adorable? <laughs> I'm like just imagining these cute little Monopoly games. And <laughs> now I will tell you, I never had the passbook, but I've, I've seen them. And you have, I mean, what dedication to go month after month and, and just get your little passbook <laughs> updated. That That's so cute. I love it. And now you're it. teaching people in that version in that way but just you mod it sounds like you just modernized the whole thing 
<laughs> well, well, things are a little bit different now, and it's a lot easier to move our, round, uh, money, our money around and be a little bit more efficient. But I'll like never forget button, that right? when we opened that account and that big banner on the wall saying, "If you did it, you know, if this was how. If you had this much in your account, this was the interest." I was like, "Oh my gosh!" So the more you have, the more interest they pay you. This is so great. <laughs> Wow. Now, how do you get people to do things like downsize or start to pay down more debt or, you know, do things that they probably wouldn't ordinarily or maybe don't want to do? I mean, you sound like maybe you have to be a psychologist yourself in your industry and kind of sit (laughs) that down and say, look, (laughs) this is something that you can't ignore. That is so true. I mean, because I I think sometimes I do think the P in CPA stands for psychologist because, I mean, I feel like I'm like, you know, trying to give them some psychological, I don't even know I'm not trained in it. Because it's so delicate, right? I mean, people get really crazy. Talk about anxiety. There is a little bit of a tough love thing going on there, though. I mean, you basically have to say, look, this is how it's going. This is is where you are. This is where you want to be. And there's this huge Grand Canyon here, and we can either start trying to build a bridge across it, or you're not going to make it to the other side. And, you know, sometimes people just need somebody to say that to them. I mean, just like our kids when they're, when they're really little, you know, of course they don't want you to, you know, pull their hand away from the stove, but, I mean, you need to get – they crave that structure too. I mean, and honestly, sometimes people just want you to tell them what they need to do because they just don't know. Tell us about the new way of coaching that you that you've. I, I see your website and how it's you know really moving into this kind of uh, holistic type of uh, perspective in your career. Well, I mean, I I just felt like a, a few years ago. I mean, I've always been doing this one on one with clients, just as we're just because I'm an entrepreneurial junkie. You can't just come in here and just say, "Here, fill out the forms." It's just not my way. I mean, I'm not everybody's cup of tea. If that's all you want, is it filled out? There's plenty of people that'll do that. So I saw that people really like that extra, you know, okay, what do these numbers mean? What can I do? How can I get to the goal? And so I just started peeling those things off and breaking them down into um, different different programs. I mean, one thing that people like is, is just a little bit of training on what are some of these rules of money. People just don't understand the rules of money. They don't understand about compound interest. They don't understand the rule of 72. A lot of jargon. It just sounds like jargon until somebody tells you what it is. I mean, it's kind of like if I went to a doctor, they'd be like, well, your CBC is blah, blah, blah. I'd be like, what? I mean, it's, money has its own language too. And so that's really what started it. It's the funny thing is, is I've moved away from it a little bit. I think I'm going to go back to it again. Where it really started is my kid. I have a six, almost 16-year-old and a almost, well, he just turned 20. Um, I saw as they were getting older, like 10, 11, 12, and we started talking about money and things like that. I was like, you know, really, somebody needs to teach these folks this. I mean, it's w- the one thing you don't learn in school that you really do need to know. I mean, they don't tell you how to what, what a credit card is or how to balance a checkbook. So I started out doing a little financial um, fitness for teens, you know, kind of like teaching them some of the basics. And I was telling my clients about it. And they're like, hey, that sounds amazing, but can I come too? I was like, sure, yeah, the parents are free, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. And it just kind of morphed from that because people really don't know this. And they're not picking up, you know, magazines or, you know, reading. I mean, I get it. I, I mean, I'm kind of like Kristen was saying, she's a little bit of geeky about some of the stuff she likes to do. I, I like to read about, you know, why we do things with money and why we're thinking this way and what's happening in you know, the world economies and stuff. Because well, that's great because we need someone like you. We only have another about another minute because I can right, listen right. to you forever. But <laughs> it's, it's great that there's someone like you out there to tell not just the adults, but the kids also. Um, I know, you know, I had my kids open a bank account. I think they were a little bit older <laughs> than I should have probably should have, you know, taught them that and started at a little earlier age. But at least I did it. And, you know, I'm trying to teach them how to save and how to give back, you know, donate and all that. Too. A huge so, part. A huge part yeah, is giving and back too, though. I'm so yeah. glad that you're, you're taking that perspective on it. So, Deborah, where can we find you and, and find more out well, about you? Well, all of my social media and my Facebook and Twitter and stuff is either Deborah Daniel 
CPA, or I think Twitter was too long, so it was Deborah D. CPA. So anyway, but it's spelled the long way, the D-E-B-O-R-A-H, and there's no S on the Daniel. Um, but also my website, DebraDaniel.com, also spelled D-E-B-O-R-A-H. And I actually have um, on there, on my website, I have what I call my money manifesto, which are just 12 rules about money that anybody can go check out. It's just, you know, talking about just some of those rules, good debt versus bad debt. And I'd love for people to just check it out. It's free information. No harm, no foul. Yeah, and you can't get better than that. I mean, you know, everyone should know the basics. And I love the videos, too. You have some great videos, too, like Dr. Colleen uh, teaching people about the basics. So thank you for so much for coming on the show and, and, you know, telling us about all this. And I'm going to go actually check out that. What is it, 12? What what did you call it? It's the Money Manifesto. Money Manifesto. Yeah, I mean, anytime, Judy. I love it. This is just kind of my jam. I like to do it. My kids get embarrassed when I say stuff like that. But <laughs> <laughs> well, but you, can, you can say whatever you want on the show, and we appreciate you coming on. And for part two of our anxiety series for next week, we're going to have on Tyrone Barrington. Now, he is a legendary modeling agent from back in the days. He discovered Tyson Beckford, and he was working with Kamora Lee Simmons and a lot of supermodels um, in his day. He's now a casting director producer and he has uh, an incredible perspective on mental health and fashion even has a nonprofit about it um so he's going to come on the show and i believe he's bringing on a supermodel too to talk about the fashion industry insiders of anxiety and the depression that goes along with that so interesting conversation and remember subscribe to us on youtube don't miss even one show WhatWomenWantRadio.com for more information, and we'll see you next week. Good night. You're listening to What Women Want with Judy Goss and Kristen West, only on LA Talk Radio.